Bob, I would love to know what's the most fundamental thing in the universe. And because I was not trained in physics, my field was in biological sciences and particularly in brain sciences, I'm a bit awed of what physicists do when they talk about a so-called final theory, unifying all the forces, explaining all the zoo of particles in some standard model or some exotic standard model. But the more this goes on, the more particles there are. And, uh, you know, is, is there a, a, a legitimate hope of, of truly getting a final theory? Well, I'm a physicist too, so I hope so. Okay. However, there's some bad news. The bad news comes from understanding how matter works. When matter is organizing itself, it makes laws, which is good, you know. It makes the laws, and it doesn't depend on the details. The laws always come out to be the same. And you can predict things with them. But the bad news is those laws blind you to the underlying microscopic causes. Why? Well, because it doesn't matter what they are, the laws that you actually measure would always be the same. We call this process renormalization in physics, it's a technical term. But as a practical matter, it means that the good, there's good news and bad news. The good news is some things are very predictable and reliable. The bad news is that the little details that led to that are not knowable until you get a new machine capable of going to such tiny scales and such high energies that the law fails. Does this mean there's some kind of a barrier that we have, whether it's, it's, it's truly an ultimate barrier or just a barrier of, of bigger machines with higher energies? I like to talk about renormalization as an epistemological barrier. Epistemological meaning n knowledge. That's right, the nature of knowledge. In other words, we think we're going to measure things and understand the fundamental parts of the universe. But unfortunately, the universe has been kind and evil at the same time. It's given us these laws, but a side effect of giving that law is it says, well, you can have this, but you can't have this other thing. That's for me. Until you make a better accelerator or whatever. Now, um, I didn't order it that way. Probably I would have been happier as an intellectual man had I been able to see through this wall. But that... Uh, that wasn't the way it is. Nature has been kind, and nature has been unkind. So people talk about string theory as one example, and then there are competing theories, uh, perhaps less, uh, less popularized, that seek to penetrate that barrier, to go deeper, and, and, to, and to get the fundamental components of these more uh, higher higher order laws so that we can find the real laws, quote unquote real laws, at these the real fundamental level. No, I, I fully understand and it's a it's a very primal human impulse to want to do that. And for what it's worth, I don't tell people what kind of research to do. I've been wrong many, many times in anticipating what would happen. However, I don't choose to spend my own time that way because I've had too many experiences of having wonderful ideas that weren't falsifiable and I thought for years and years they were right and then the experiments improved and I found that they weren't. So I've learned the hard way that the art of good physics is to ask a question that's just barely beyond where the technology can go and then you place your bets. And if you're right, you win the bet. If you're wrong, you lose. Now, falsifiable is a princer, popper's concept of, of uh, you, you can't prove theories right, you can only prove theories wrong. And if you have, an, if you, if you have theories that are, that are uh, exhaustive, that cover the landscape, and you can eliminate by falsifying all but one in the ideal world, then that's the one you're left with. So you never prove something right, you can always prove everything else wrong. Now, how does that 
uh, apply to these most fundamental laws. You're saying that you you have to be at a point where where you your your experimental machinery is able to penetrate that, and if you can't do it, it's not falsifiable now, but it may be in the future. Um, yes, but it's a little more subtle than that. Nature is full of traps. It's full of things that have ambiguous meanings, where you can never do an experiment that will clear things up. When matter, for example, is poised right at a phase transition, it behaves in the most schizophrenic way. It's a very foolish place to do an experiment. So it's very easy to pose theoretical questions that will just never get answered. Now, a good theoretical question is one that will get answered. And what I mean by this is your friends will cut your head off if the experiment comes out a certain way. In other words, in order for the bet to be meaningful, there has to be a possibility of losing it. Mm. So what does that imply about a final theory? Is, is, is it possible to, to have one? Well, we're circling around here we're, and it's hard to... Here we're, we're in the realm of speculation now. I personally think it's too early historically to have the, f the final theory of the universe because the experiments aren't nearly good enough to distinguish one of them from another. Even if you had the technology to ramify those equations and figure out what our world should be like, which you don't at the moment, there would still be more than one of them. And that being the case, you have to wait until the technology improves to distinguish among the possible ultimate theories. But in principle, there's, there should be no obstacle. In principle. Well, like I said, as a theorist, I certainly hope there is. I see no objective evidence that there isn't one. I just, so my read on the experimental situation is that it's just way too early historically. And I, what I mean by way too early is perhaps millennia. Th that long? Because you need the, the, the energy levels to be at a certain? Correct, in other words, the, the the amount of speed, energy scale, and so forth, the technology you need is so stupendously beyond where we are right now that I don't think it's going to come for many, many generations. Well, how about the coherence of theory, where some theories seem to work so beautifully and, and, being, and, and having the particles and the forces kind of fall out of the theories as, as, uh, as almost... Uh, uh, something that was not predictable from the theory itself, but they just happened. I mean, that, that seems to be a very strong indication. Well, I know, um, and it unfortunately, it's one of the strongest indications also when you're pursuing what I call a deceitful turkey. That is to say, a theory that looks beautiful but is always fooling you, always beyond reach. Now, in the case of a student coming to me with such an argument, I would stop the student right there Say, show me a number. Show me a number, you predict, a measured number. And, and let's compare it with experiment right now. And usually the discussion ends right there. Mm. Because it turns out calculating actual numbers and actual things you measure about the vacuum is exceedingly difficult. My colleagues in string theory are not remotely near an ability to do that yet, which they'll be happy to tell you. Now, I personally think that, that at that point, we, well, we are having a different conversation, and I'm not, I'm not going to live all that long. I would really <laughs> rather spend my time working on things you can measure.